welcome you to our sixth, I believe, meeting of uh, the HeartMind Metro DC IONS community group. Um, is it our sixth in a row now? Yeah, that's right. Yeah? yeah? So we have uh, gathered quite a momentum with these meetings. And uh, today we are coming to what I think is the crux of our exploration so far. The whole journey of trying to understand the intersection between the psychological and the spiritual. Um, the nature of mind, exploring heart-mind epistemology, really is ultimately, and I know that's what attracted all of you here, it was the question of how does all this understanding transform our will? How does all this understanding change the way that we live, change the ways that we create communities, environments, and engage the world in this very, very difficult time? So talking about free will today, free will and health from a developmental perspective, I hope will really uh, bring together all the strengths uh, of our conversations so far. And after that, we will have to, maybe all of us, give a little thought to what we hope to see this group evolve towards, where we hope to see a movement forward. And of course, that'll be a decision for everybody that has been participating here for the past uh, five weeks. Well, 10. 12 weeks. 12 weeks, thank you. Yeah, from January, mid-January we started. Yeah, that's good. All right. So before I proceed with a developmental perspective on free will in the lifespan, I wanted to ask you to take a few moments and center yourselves because, of course, there's been a lot of action, another busy weekend, probably cherry blossoms and other wonderful things engaging you. Hopefully, you've had some of that joy. And uh, so it would be nice to take a few moments to center ourselves in a more meditative space. So I would suggest that we put our hands on our heart and we close our eyes and begin to bring our attention to our breath Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, rounded lips, extending the breaths out all the way into the abdomen as we breathe in spaciousness and breathe out any distractions and residue tension and thought. And with each next breath in, we center ourselves ever so much more deeply into the area of the heart, applying little pressure with our hand in the heart area, feeling that contact, and really bringing our attention with the breath to the heart. Breathing into a spacious heart, breathing out any tension and distraction. Allowing the mind to quiet, allowing the body to relax. allowing the heart to soften. Allowing thoughts to just pass through as we inhale spaciousness of heart and we exhale busyness. and become aware of your own energies. Notice the way the energies are moving and flowing through your body. No 
notice a subtler awareness of how that energy feels in your body. <coughs> notice small intuitions that may be arising. And continue to breathe rhythmically, ensuring that your breaths out are much longer than the breaths in and relaxing into a place of heart. <coughs> into this space of heartfulness, space of centeredness and peace. And as you remain for a few quiet moments centered in this way, allow yourselves to become gently aware of what bubbles up for you as you contemplate free will. What are the questions? What are the hopes? What are the expectations? What are the dilemmas that bubble up as you reflect on free will? we're ready and it feels right, you're welcome to bring your awareness back into this <coughs> lovely space of light. And it would be very, very nice if some of you could share what bubbles up for you as you contemplate Tonight's theme, the theme of free will. Please. Um, the first thing that came up was um, my ego and just the fact that like, I can choose to act out in lots of ways mm. that are not necessarily in keeping with the spiritual spiritual teachings that I follow or my best mm. interests mm. or that of those around me. Mm. Um, so when I get upset or act passive aggressive or cut someone off or mm. you know, I'm thinking about little things, but um, so that's a that's a part. It's a function of our free will. Yes. Um, and then was ref reflecting on choice mm. and the fact that I can choose to follow God and what I've been taught and my higher nature or not. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for opening up the conversation. Yes, when we think about free will in the context of our lives, we think about the freedom and the burden of choice the choices that we actually make all the time. 
conscious choices, not so conscious choices, thought through, not so thought through. So with free will in our lives also enters a certain burden and a certain responsibility. And it really is important for us to be able to think in a more systematic way about the nature and evolution of free will in our own lives, in the choices that we struggle with, and also there are a number of parents in this room who are trying to raise young children, and this is certainly a very pivotal question in parenting. How do you help your children cultivate their free will? And what is the process involved in that? So thank you so much for getting us going. Let's hear some other thoughts on free will, things that bubbled up for you. Earl? Well, what bubbled up for me was <coughs> if, if you're not aware, then do you have free will? Because if you're aware, then that means you, you are thinking about a choice or what the choice is, mm. and what the consequences or <coughs> what the results are from a particular choice, good or bad or different. Right. But if you aren't aware, you're just acting out of habit or anger or reaction, then are you really, I mean, is that free choice or is that just... Reaction. So that's another great question, and thank you so much. When we are not aware, do we still have free will? Are we still acting out of free will? So these are questions that we will actually return to in, in the end and see if today's discussion has in any way addressed these questions and uh, offered some interesting perspectives. So, but that's another good question to put in the back of our minds as, as we explore the development of, of free will. So thank you both. All right, any other thoughts or um, reflections? Josh? Bubble up in my mind was potential mm. and un untapped potential. Um, and, and sort of mixed in with that the idea of destiny. Um, the idea of there potentially being a destiny mm. that so free will really is associated with small choices, daily choices, but it's also associated with destiny, and it's also associated with awareness. So these are very key concepts that we're really trying to understand better, not theoretically, but very much in terms of what, what that means. What does it mean to fulfill your potential. All right, any other thoughts on free will? Well, what I thought about for me is thinking that, you know, when we were born, we come to this world with nothing. Mm. And then it's really, truly that uh, there is this blank canvas that is given to us so that we can paint our life what we choose mm. our life to be mm. is there. And then when we want to, we can erase it and start over and mm. clean over and push. Wow. Yeah, it's just that was the Wow, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Nardos. It's, it's so uh, beautiful to think about painting on this blank canvas and then being able to look at what you've painted, reconsider and possibly paint again or paint differently. So free will is really a lifespan process. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions, reflections on free will so far? So maybe we can start rolling here and things will begin to take more shape as the conversation deepens. Uh, when we talk about free will, we are really, really talking about the forward motion of life. And we said at the very beginning of our meetings here 
that the forward motion of life is a process of meaning making for us human beings. And that the process of free will, we will explore it today as a process of meaning making. What is meaningful to, to us around which we make our choices? And how, because this meaning-making evolves developmentally through the lifespan, so does the way that we use our free will, the way that we structure our choices. Mm. I would definitely uh, encourage all of you for our uh, last meeting in April, the 22nd of April, to consider reviewing these early lectures uh, and particularly lecture three, but actually probably all the earlier ones, um, so that we can begin to think in our next meeting from the point of view of our free will and everything that we have explored so far conceptually, what is the direction that is emerging for this group that this group would like to envisage as part of its exercise of will. But for today, we want to see what the development of free will actually looks like developmentally. It does center around meaning, and when meaning is lost, we stumble, we experience a paralysis of will, and we also experience all the variations of anxiety, depression, and all human forms of suffering associated with our ability or perceived inability to exercise our free will. So, one of the things we spoke about, though, is that no matter what happens at any particular moment, we always have the choice in the very next moment, in the very next now, to recommit ourselves to the search for meaning and for the more conscious an intentional exercise of our free will. And in that sense, each dead end or each perceived dead end, each breakdown, each challenge on our path are also an opportunity to revisit our exercise of choice and will, to revisit what is meaningful to us and to begin to modify the picture that we've already painted on that empty, initially empty canvas. So, and nothing forces us to face that reflection, that reflection more starkly than what we call death. Really, the dawning point of contemplation about the reality of human spirit comes when we contemplate death. That is the time when we really ask ourselves about the nature of rational consciousness and why it actually appears in this realm as a, in, in a human being. And having once appeared, how does it make sense that it simply comes to an end and does it? So this question, the question about death and the reality of rational consciousness and the purpose for its appearance here is a question that most adults, especially in the Western world, defer as much as possible for as long as possible. But uh, in the last months, uh, really climaxing two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., we saw that because of our choice to defer this, this question, Young people are facing this question in ways that are dramatic and well beyond what they should be facing at their age. Most of them having to ask questions about the meaning of life and the exercise of free will facing the barrel of a gun. And so at our last meeting, we shared that, and it was happening the evening after uh, the March on Washington, March for Our Lives, in that very evening, we talked about the fact that these young people's march and all the adults that were supporting them was really a march in the spirit of reverence for life, for human choice, and 
they were asking this adult world, which seems to have abdicated its exercise of free will, at what point will governing adults, and particularly Washington DC, begin to make choices that manifest unambivalently reverence for life. And so it was actually at the end of last discussion on reverence, the experience of reverence, that we came to the conclusion that the time has come to talk about free will because reverence and free will are deeply connected. So in our excessive and distorted interpretation of personal freedom in the West, we have in fact put our children at unthinkable risk. Understanding freedom in such an extreme way that this extreme understanding has trapped us to where we are anything but free. We are scared for our lives. We are scared for our children. And that really illustrates the spiritual principle of using our will with moderation. Any extreme form of using will, independently, so to speak, really traps us and actually takes away our ability to feel freedom. And so let's look at what all this means developmentally. As I speak about the development of free will today, I'll be drawing on two models in the spirit of seeking the intersection between psychology and spirituality, I'll be drawing on a developmental model of the uh, transformations of constructions of self and other by uh, Robert Keegan. And I will also be drawing on the mystical developmental writings of Baha'u'llah known as the Four Valleys and the Seven Valleys. And so you've seen here this familiar helix of development, which you've heard me speak about once, when we think about the lifespan, we think about it as a helix with two very large cycles. <coughs> the first is usually what we think about the lifespan, and that is the cycle of ego formation, the formation of self, and the second cycle is one that we had for a while forgotten, but that both developmental psychology and quantum physics and advanced sciences of all, uh, of all kinds, including medicine, are reminding us that with the formation of mature adulthood begins a second cycle of self-transcendence. And so we have to now look at what the development of will actually looks like in these cycles. So one way to think about these cycles, I will offer different models as I said, one way is to think about um, them as four valleys and the first would be the valley of self. And it's a very important part of the life cycle where we form our sense of self and we then construct and reconstruct and expand our sense of self and other. The next one would be the valley of reason. As the sense of self <coughs> matures, we come more and more into the exploration of meaning, and purpose, and what really makes sense in this life. And then, the more we explore the valley of reason, the more we experience the limitations of the valley of reason, we find ourselves moved and attracted beyond linear reason into a valley that is propelled forward by the force of attraction. And this valley has been described as the valley of love. And ultimately, for those of us who continue the journey, who continue the quest, we at some point begin to experience what has been described as the unity of self, reason, and love. 
the fourth valley where the individual will is so naturally aligned with the greater will of life that there are no dichotomies. And so the direction of this movement is the integration of or the valley of self, the unity of self, So what does this mean? As you can see, this is, of course, these are metaphors. And what do these metaphors really mean? What are they really pointing us to? So this first spiral, which is really the spiral of most of our experiences, children and adults, uh, is a spiral that is also characterized by limitations. So we will call this the plane of limitation. Limitation, and because there's limitation, there's also tension, there's also conflict, there's also opposition. Limitation and conflict. <coughs> So let's talk about what this actually looks like developmentally. So from the point of view of our sense of who we are, this spiral actually contains several stages within it, which I'm going to number as one, a zero, one, two, three, and four. And these stages are stages in the formation of what we understand as self and what we understand as other. The first stage is called the incorporative stage in development, and that is really the infant. And the infant has this sense of itself as I am my reflexes, my senses, my movement, the other, any other, is really experienced as an extension of me. There practically is no other yet in the life of the incorporative self. And then begins a process of gradual differentiation and integration as the infant begins to develop and in the period between birth and two years, the infant transitions into a different developmental balance called the impulsive balance, where the sense of self is built around, I am my impulses and my perceptions, and I have reflexes, senses, and movements. What does that mean? That really means that I have to, at all cost, act out of my impulses because I am that. And if my impulses are not satisfied, I, in a sense, cease to exist. So these are early developments. And in these early developments, there are also a lot of risks. And it's hard to really talk about free will in these early developments. <clears throat> in the incorporative self, the infant is held by the mothering culture. And the risks of that development are that the mothering culture may not be emotionally or in other ways available, which plunges an infant into negotiating attachment issues. And these attachment issues can be the source of great anxiety and suffering later on in adult life. So, from the very beginning, we are fraught as we try to form a stable sense of self. We're also fraught with challenges and difficulties. And these challenges and difficulties, of course, are also opportunities. Because while the child does not have a whole lot of choice, as soon as we begin to move into adolescence, we begin to have the opportunity to make choices increasingly, and choices that can heal us or can deepen these wounds. So in 
the incorporative self. We want to know that we are firmly held, that we can attach well, and that our very basic primitive will is taken care of because our needs are being met. The danger of this transition towards the, uh, from the incorporative to the impulsive self is that there may be a prolonged separation of the infant from its caregiver, possibly the mother, and particularly in the period between six months and two years, these separations can create the ground for great anxiety later on. So as the child begins to establish itself into a vertical world of movement and begins to make choices, more and more choices, about how to assert its little will, uh, it begins to enter what we call the terrible twos. And with the terrible twos, the child moves towards a stage two, which we call the imperial self. Um, and, and that, of course, is a very revealing name. The imperial self, would you like me to write them down? Mm -hmm. Might that be helpful? Oh, here we go. What's characteristic of the imperial self is that the child perceives itself as I am my dispositions, my interests, my needs, my wishes, and I am embedded in a family and peer culture that recognizes the roles that I perform. And so in this environment, we already experience all kinds of pushes and pulls of the child's budding sense of will and, and choice. But the will is directed towards fulfilling roles, claiming roles in the family, and also in the peer culture. So it's uh, interesting because the risk of that period is, because the family culture is the culture of embeddedness, the risk of that period is the dissolution of the family culture, especially in the age between five and seven. Developmentally, that can cause all kinds of per perturbations of personal will and the child's ability to assert their own will. So you can see that we are very definitely here in the realm of the formation of what is me and what is other. And how do I relate to me and how do I relate to the other? Okay, so many of us have heard probably uh, this epitome of the imperial will, um, drive me to the mall and get out of my life. <laughs> so you other, particularly the parenting other, exist solely for the purpose of meeting my needs, my interests, my inclinations, and you really do not have a separate existence. But what has a separate existence is the peer culture. Because with the peer culture, I can trade my ability to meet my needs and interests and inclinations. And I can trade roles, and I can assert my will, and I can be recognized within that peer culture. So, so this is a way that the human will, as you can see, evolves through a lot of pushing and pulling and all kinds of risks along the way. Eventually, the school child begins to discover more and more that peer relationships are not just about trading interests um, and needs and wishes, but there is a special joy in forming those special friendships. And what emerges very gradually in the teen, preteen and teen years, really, is the culture of mutuality, which is known as stage three, the interpersonal self. The personal self construct its, constructs itself as I am my relationships. I am my mutual relationships. I am as good as in my mutual relationships, people reflect back to me that I meet their needs. I am as good as are my mutual relationships. I am as good as my girlfriend 
wants me or loves me or needs me day and night around the clock. That's how good I am and that's who I am. Okay? And in this interpersonal culture, I have dispositions and needs and interests, but I can put them on hold or they're subjugated to the culture of mutuality. I will compromise my interests, my needs, what I want to do in order to create this culture of a mutual relationship with my girlfriend, with my uh, special buddy. And that culture of mutuality is already a qualitative shift in the way that we start to use our will. We start to sacrifice our immediate desires in order to create relationships and in order to sustain relationships. Of course, the risk of that uh, transitional period towards the interpersonal self is that there can be family relocations in what is the most sensitive age for the formation of these very special exclusive relationships, which is between 12 and 16. By 16, the culture of mutuality is fairly established and the young person knows or is feeling competent enough in creating mutual relationships. And so moves after that are a little easier to negotiate. Moves before that can be quite challenging. And especially you can see that this whole developmental trajectory would be made very, very difficult for what is known as military brats who move every year or two from place to place. Um, that really challenges the way that their will is able to evolve developmentally. So, as we experience the joys and the heartbreaks of interpersonal relationships, at some point we begin to discover that beyond the mutuality, the joys of mutuality, we need some kind of more solid ground. We need some sense of what we're really about, who we are, what we value, what our calling in life is, um, really our place, our ideology. And so with that we see the emergence of stage four, which is really the epitome of the well-formed Western adult, and that is the institutional self. And the institutional self, the name institutional self really speaks for itself. The institutional self is an institution. I am my um, values, my autonomy, my self-chosen <coughs> identity. Okay, I have relationships and I can create relationships, but only to the extent to which they don't interfere with my values and autonomy and life purpose. So as you can see, this is a stage that is overly differentiated. This is a stage that is overly integrated. And that is the movement that we see. On this side, we've got here integration, differentiation, integration, differentiation. And there is a tension and a swing from each stage to the opposite. And in all of that, you can see the plane of tension, the plane of conflict. At every point, I am having to discover how I can meet my sense of will, my sense of self, and how I can negotiate that of the other, okay? So you can see that, in fact, in the majority of the um, adult life, we really struggle with internal tensions and conflicts. And we also struggle with tensions and conflicts with other people that are around their will, our will, their construction of self, their construction of boundaries, our construction of boundaries. So all of this is, is clearly a process that is very uh, full of ups and downs and, and challenges and, and heartache. And of course, um, in, in the spiritual literature, this whole cycle is often referred to as being dominated by the insistent self. The insistent self that wants, that
that pursues and uh, is still in the process of being in this push-pull with the rest of the world. As we begin to feel confident in our sense of autonomy and self-defined identity, we also begin to experience the limitations of these constructs. And so, along with the growing confidence in our own institution and the way our own institution is serving us, career-wise, relationship-wise, um, in the public sphere as well, we also begin to realize that something in all of these constructions is actually very relative and doesn't really hold. And at that point, oftentimes, adults begin to experience the awakening and increasingly conscious search for our true self. The question emerges, what is my true self? This, in the Seven Valleys, is called the Valley of Search. This is, for the first time, our awakening to there is something more beyond the push and pulls of my individual will vis-a-vis -vis the will of other people around me. There is, for the first time, the awakening of this sense, there is more to the experience of life. And what is that? So, our awakening to the quest for a true self, our awakening for the quest engages this plane of reason. More and more, this plane of reason is actually the transition between the plane of limitation and the plane of unity. With reason, we begin to question our own constructs. With reason, we begin to realize increasingly honestly the limitations of our own self-constructed identities, the limitations of the values which were absolute earlier on and were really pursued to the utmost. We begin to experience these limitations and we begin to ask what is beyond that? What is the meaning beyond that? <clears throat> and with that, we begin to move in the direction of self-actualization and gradually self-transcendence. The, the point of self-actualization is also the point of self-transcendence. At this point, people typically will come and say, I lost my job, my partner left me, Life as I knew it, as was organized for me, and as I thought it was going to be until I age, has suddenly shifted. The, the, the rug has been pulled from under my feet, and I really don't know at this point what my life is really about. And that really sets people on the deeper quest of what life is really about. In this transition, what we begin to discover more and more is moral and spiritual values, the epistemology behind them. Moral values become more and more investigated and even accepted, and spiritual values as well. But what's very interesting is because this is the path of reason, these moral and spiritual values, even as they are investigated, and possibly even embraced, have not yet transformed the human will. So the transformation of the human will is a process of attraction. It is the process of attraction to spiritual intuitions, to spiritual beauty, to spiritual awareness to that which we spoke about earlier as the epistemology of heart. The more we understand the limitations of reason, the more we realize that despite all of the moral values and spiritual values that we've embraced, we're still in conflict. We're still in conflict with ourselves and with our values because it is not until the human will is actually transformed that 
the plane of conflict is left behind and more and more the movement of self-transcendence is a movement of opening ourselves to the experience of love, to the experience of interdependence, to the experience of this profound relationship between the individual will and the greater will in which all things gain meaning and no challenge, no crisis look random anymore. Everything is experienced as purposeful, as wise, and tensions fall to the side. That doesn't mean there is no hardship. That doesn't mean there is no pain. It just means that the experience of conflict and tension subsides as the individual will finds its center in the realm of heart, in the valley of love, and is increasingly attracted to the essential unity of life. So we begin to glimpse, and this is a lengthy process. We're talking about a lifespan here. So this is a little chart of a whole lifespan. <laughs> Apparently, this is a very lengthy and not even a linear, but a very convoluted back and forth process of catching more and more glimpses of the valley of heart, of the valley of love along the way, and then these glimpses becoming more of a critical mass and prevailing over our more linear, thinking and our more um, narrowly constructed sense of self and will mm -hmm. and loyalties. And eventually the balance shifts in, a, in the direction of what is experienced as the unity of life. With which, of course, the human will is fundamentally transformed. And in the realm of utmost poverty, the sages of human history have radiated complete happiness, complete health, sense of well-being, contagious joy, contagious health, because when we align ourselves to the wisdom, with the wisdom of the whole, and move with it without resisting and pulling, it is really amazing, the experience of health and the release of energy. There is a lot of individual and psychological psychic energy that is engaged here in the pushes and pulls of self and other and the reconstructions of self and other. That's a lot of heartache and, <laughs> and headache. <laughs> and when these energies begin to be released, there is a sense that people consistently report as tremendous simplicity all of a sudden complicated things begin to feel simple and profound. And actually every experience, every encounter, every act begins to feel profound. There's no, nothing is mundane anymore. Nothing is the daily choice. Everything is experienced as part of a very profound reality that exists simultaneously in the eternal now. And so every movement, every glance, every gesture, every connection, everything is significant and, and generates and is generative. So this is an extraordinary journey, really an extraordinary journey. And in this journey, the more we understand it, the more we are infused with compassion because it really is not easy to negotiate all these tension, not to mention the developmental snags along the way of trying to figure out who you are, who's the other, how you relate to the other, how to meet your basic sense of self and negotiate with this other. There's just a lot of unknown, a lot of difficulty, and understanding really does bring compassion. It also brings a very clear sense, especially for us as parents, what it is that we are really trying to provide as a backdrop for this journey for our children. They cannot avoid this journey. That is a journey they have to be on. That's part of the life journey, self-formation and then self-transcendence. But if the backdrop, and here we talked in previous uh, lectures about languages, languages that become holding environments. If the backdrop of this developmental journey 
is the language of individualism, the language of success, the language of you're on your own, get out there and make it. That will intensify tensions that are already quite challenging and, and deepen the level of experience of anxiety, um, anger, and here some, some uh, descriptors of the self that I wanted to offer you. So these early uses of will, as you can tell, are very hedonistic and aggressive. All the way to including the imperial self, we have a very hedonistic, okay, hedonistic meaning seeking pleasure, and aggressive use of will basically promoting my own agenda, getting my needs met, <laughs> and using the other to negotiate that, really. And then, as we move into the relational self, it is really less hedonistic, it is less overtly aggressive, but we also see the birth of what's been called the blaming soul. <laughs> the blaming soul, the desiring soul. I want things from the other, and I blame them for not providing them to me, okay? And so that's, the will here permutates into a different range of tensions, but it's all still quite difficult and painful. So if the backdrop of this evolution here is a language of individualism, a language of disconnect, a language of materialism, success is defined as what wealth can you accumulate vis-a-vis -vis others in competition with others, how can you assert yourself, how you, can you get ahead, how can you become more popular, more famous, more successful, more wealthy, more um, good-looking, whatever it is, the, the, the culture of competition, that will really intensify these struggles of will and, uh, and, and really deepen the sense of conflict, the sense of limitation. There is no, when you look at this, there is no surprise now that we started our very first talk by saying that the World Health Organization has now recognized that we are in such steep rise of mental illness, and particularly anxiety and depression are the global pandemic, that they are the ones that are taking the greatest toll on, uh, on the resources of the world, not physical diseases anymore. Of course, because we live on in a reality um, which is becoming really increasingly competitive. We have exported global capitalism in its most extreme individualistic forms all over the planet. Every developing country around the world is one way or another trying to catch up with that model. <clears throat> and so the sense of tension and conflict and reeling with our own internal conflicts and efforts to assert our will is really taking massive proportions. Alternatively, as parents, we could provide and we strive to provide a backdrop to the evolution of this will by creating a culture and a language at home and a holding environment that reminds the child that despite all the pushes and pulls and conflicts that you experience all the time, you are essentially a spiritual being. You are something more than all of these pushes and pulls and fears and anxieties and conflicts that you're negotiating every day and that you have to keep tuning in to your own heart in order to hear its deeper callings, its deeper intuitions. And it is amazing how early we can tell children when they are in a dilemma and come to ask for advice, go take a little quiet time and listen to your own heart and see what your heart tells you. And why do children very often come back with really profound answers. Because, of course, their spiritual nature, their original spiritual nature, their soul, and therefore the intuitions of their soul, haven't yet been layered too heavily, plastered with all these layers of social constructions about what is success and uh, what's worthy and what makes you popular and all of that. There's still a lot of innocence 
in the earlier stages and when we encourage a child to really listen to its heart, it will come back. The language of virtues as those spiritual potentialities in a child is very powerful. When you ask a child in this difficult situation, what gem within, what virtue within could perhaps help you? I have been repeatedly surprised at how profound and astute the answers of little children are. They do know the answer. And it is not a process of reason. It is not a rational process. It is spiritual intuition. So if we cultivate children's spiritual intuition with a family and community culture that recognizes interdependence and the ultimate essential nature of spiritual reality, individual and collective, if that is the backdrop of the evolution of will, children and all of us have a much greater chance to negotiate these tensions between self and other in a lot less traumatic, anxiety and depression prone manner. They will still have their challenges, but they will manifest a lot more resilience and they will have more of a sense of their own resources even when it is difficult. The greatest stuckness that we see in the adult world right now is in the institutional self, because the institutional self in the Western world is highly rewarded. Highly rewarded. If you can be your own institution, your own ideology, with your own sense of values and place in the social world and place in the professional world and career and aspirations and agenda for your development, for your family, for when and how you continue to work until you secure your family, what is the, the kind of wealth that is your own goal, what do you want to do in the world, all of that is the ultimate social language we're exposed to. There practically is not in the larger social environment a language that goes beyond that. So once again, that's the reason why most competent adults get very, very stuck in the valley of reason, which remember I said earlier, is a transitional valley. It is supposed to help us through the exercise of the faculty of reason broadly understood, not just left brain, but broadly understood reason. It is supposed to help us transition from the valley of self to the valleys of unity, of love and unity. It is supposed to help us reflect on the meaning of life. But if reason is uh, constructed rationalistically as narrow rationalism coupled with materialism, and that is really how we understand the ceiling of development. Become your own person, right? Have your own career. Assert yourself in the social world. If that is the epitome of our discourse, then why would we not prize the right to carry guns more than the protection of children's lives and of life in general. The institutional self is all about its own rights. The concept of interdependence is yet to emerge as the institutional self experiences its limitations, the limitations of its constructions. And so the irony of this profound historical moment is that it is our children that are taking public stands now and are challenging the limitations of our institutions and engaging the discourse in such a way that we can perhaps see how limited our construction of rights is. <clears throat> and so this is a moment in which we have to ask ourselves, what can each of us do both individually and as communities, as families, as groups, as networks, in order to truly broaden the conversation beyond the valley of the institutional self and help collective humanity begin to understand that there is a larger language, a larger vision and purpose to development that stage four is only stage four. 
What continues here is up to stage nine, the value of unity in terms of, and it varies, different models vary. Some will call it nine, some will say it's 10, but in any case, there's either nine or 10 stages, and of those, as you saw, there's only three that are really childhood. The rest is adulthood. So if this is what we consider the climax <laughs> of our development as a culture, as uh, adults and as, as values and as social systems, then we're completely misunderstanding the trajectory of development. The purpose of self-formation is self-transcendence and discovering the unity of life and the interdependence of life. And it is in that process that we gain ultimate health. So free will is completely connected to the experience of health. We can never experience perfect health here. There's too much tension, there's too much conflict. It's a matter of balance. There will be more health if the balance is going in the right direction. But there will be conflict, there will be anxiety, there will be stress, there will be various somatic symptoms, especially in the world in which we live right now and the kind of food that we are eating. All of that will play into it, of course. But the, the movement towards health is actually a movement beyond the institutional self towards self-transcendence, when all systems, physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual, begin to come into alignment. And in a simple and increasingly organic way, communicate, are integrated, become one whole. That is the experience of health, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual health. So the movement towards health and the evolution of our experience of will, free will, and choice are completely connected. So with this, I'd like to close and uh, really allow you now in your groups, to, which we will form in a moment, to reflect on the exercise of will and the evolution, the developmental evolution in the exercise of will as you have experienced it in your lives and observed it, observed it in your lives. And I'd just like to close by saying that as we begin to move in the direction towards the valley of unity, what we begin to experience more and more <clears throat> is how prominent our spiritual intuitions are and how easily we can be guided by them if we only tune in and pay attention. We begin to choose our spiritual values and our life choices are aligned with our values not because they should be, but because that is the force of attraction. It is an experience of exhilaration, of excitement and exhilaration. It is the only course conceivable. And of course, the epitome of this complete integration of moral heroism, divine philosophy and saintly love are the manifestations of the unknowable essence in this plane of reality. Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, Moses, Christ, Muhammad, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, as well as those earlier ones that are not recorded in written human history. Each of them was that ultimate embodiment of the unity between the individual and the divine will, the unknowable will. This embodiment of moral values, of real divine philosophy, understanding of the ultimate meaning of life and life's journey. And at the same time, really saintly love, just full of compassion for every step along the human journey. Complete lack of judgment, understanding, complete understanding, complete seeing, complete compassion. And in that, the force of attraction that they exuded was powerful. In their presence, people were pulled upward in their developmental helix and trajectory by the force of attraction. 
So there's a lot here to think about in terms of what that means for our lives and choices, especially where we are right now as a collective civilization, more and more globally so, certainly in this country, and the languages that support us being really stuck in this very conflict-ridden part of the cycle. And what can each of us do? What is each of us doing to broaden and deepen the vision, to provide, to restore the true backdrop of the development of individual and collective will where it needs to be? Because we said in the beginning, the forward motion of life is a motion of meaning making. And it is really about meaning. What is the meaning of this journey if it stops here? And that's why people are feeling so depressed. If it stops here, death becomes very arbitrary. And the question, why does rational consciousness appear in the human being only to be ultimately destroyed, is a very devastating question. If the meaning of the human journey ends here, what can we do? What are we doing in order to restore the full meaning of the human journey, which allows us to continue to evolve our, the use of our free will, but in ways that have perspective. So I have written here um, the, the questions with which we began, and I'd like to come back to them after you have had a chance to form now circles and take some time for consultation in your circles on what you have heard and its meaning. Nar Nargis. I have a question yes. here. So where does the free will start? So this is a very good question. Apparently, <clears throat> the wisdom, the mystical traditions tell us that God speaks in every heart and every heart knows. And you can see that in little children. So as early as the impulsive self you already see will. On some level, the little child already can know if you encourage them to pause and know. If you speak that language with them, does that feel good? What is your heart telling you? It is really amazing how much little children know. Of course, is it conscious? No, it is intuitive. So little children have this intuition of choice, even though it's only an intuition of choice if we foster it. It's there, but they really depend on us to name it and to grow there on. It's, it's pretty clear. And of course, I have to tell you that uh, many of us adults have very uneven developmental profiles. So in some aspects of our lives, we can act fairly imperial. <laughs> like when we're driving, for example. <laughs> Um, I know from personal experience, you know, how do people dare to get in my way when I'm really in a hurry here? Um, we can, in, in our special relationships, really devolve into interpersonal constructions. You have to meet my needs. How come you're not meeting my needs? That's the blaming self. Okay? And so, you know, in different areas of our lives, in our professions, we most quickly rise to the institutional because that's encouraged and it's also easy. The institutional self, when you we have a professional identity, really feels very good. But that doesn't mean that on the road you may not be exhibiting some imperial aspects and in your relationship at home you may not be struggling over here. So we all have uneven profiles and it's not so much about what box we put ourselves in developmentally, but rather looking at that as a map and more, more importantly even as a process, as a process with various tensions and uh, um, just understanding what supports this forward process and what um, makes it more prone to becoming stuck in various places. <coughs> So really, that's where... I just want to know if you were going to, at another time, talk about the other stages. Well, maybe we should do that. You know, uh, I would love to do that. 
um, it would be a mystical conversation. And that would be a conversation that maybe everybody can contribute to from uh, those mystical sources that we're familiar with. That would be a very enriching conversation. What happens when the institutional self begins to experience its own limitations and to redefine and expand? That would be a wonderful um, purpose of a next meeting. I'm very much hoping that as we reflect on this lecture on free will and the five preceding this one, we will be able on the 22nd to have a consultation about what do we want to see going forward, how we want as a group to work together to make these concepts, this understanding more applied, what is missing for us, all of this will be a conversation to come. But we can come back to that. Now I'd like to ask you to form little groups of uh, maybe three, if this uh, large group can, can split into three smaller groups, that would give everybody a chance to, to share. So if you want to all maybe get up and uh, stir yourselves a little bit and, uh, and move around so that you can uh, really form. Getting ready to wrap up, but not before we have been enriched by the wisdom of the group here. You have been enriched by the wisdom of your uh, smaller groups, and now we want to give some space and time for sharing in the larger group, because obviously this was a very vast journey that we embarked on, really trying to understand free will and then also the development of free will in the lifespan. And of course, one of the groups even asked the question, what is the definition of free will? What is free will? What are we talking about? <laughs> so in fact, to simplify it, do we ever really have the capacity to choose freely? Do we ever choose freely? Or are our choices entirely conditioned by our personal history, our social history, uh, our cultural history, do we in fact choose freely? At what point do we choose freely? And I know we started with earlier asking the question, if you're not aware that you're making a choice, are you still making a choice? <laughs> so what is the relationship between free will and awareness? So we opened up some very, very large questions here, and it'd be very helpful to hear what significances you found in, in your small group discussions. And also, that was the first question, what did you see as really significant here for yourselves? And the second question was, um, since so much of the conversation about the development of self and will seems to end in our public spaces at the level of the institutional self, therefore rendering human life rather meaningless, mm -hmm. as people generally will say, what are we doing, what can we be doing more to really broaden the horizon in terms of meaning. Choice is always in the direction of what is more meaningful. If this is ultimate meaning, there's no choice beyond that. What are we doing? What can we do? So these, again, these are very big questions, and obviously we can't exhaust them tonight, but maybe we can hear a few more voices. So, please. Anything that came up in your groups? Maybe you can share. Yes, Margaret. Sure. We looked at, we had an example of a parent who was looking at their son who would do a puzzle and then take the puzzle apart and then do the puzzle all over again for the process. We thought that worked as an interesting metaphor for some of this, this journey where you would cycle around and maybe do shoots or, or slides to get from one point to the other and it could happen in an instant. But we looked at that, that element of a process and then also thought through how we would um, learn from that process mm. um, and then how we could share that with the people around us or in our day-to-day -day mm. life and by um, at the very least stopping periodically to say hey uh, what could I add to this or where am I <laughs> where would I be on the big spiral mm. all right so element of process, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting how you described the process, stopping, regrouping, changing the picture, uh, mm -hmm. as you were saying, uh, Nardus, initially. Um, 
so the process happens a moment at a time. Mm -hmm. So free will then happens a moment at a time. And it has something to do with what a number of you have said, described in terms of pausing, becoming aware, deciding, moving again. So the process of the exercise of free will is a process of choosing awareness. Mm. We choose awareness. We cannot say, oh, but I didn't have awareness. Yeah, we didn't have awareness, but we always have the option to choose awareness. Awareness is cultivated. Mm. Mm. In fact, that is very much the journey, the developmental journey. The incorporative self has no awareness of other. Everything is an extension of itself. But the whole developmental spectrum is about a growing awareness of what is self, what is other, what are the ways that they relate. And so that re uh, awareness can be deepened to what are the choices I'm making in every moment. Uh, how am I making these choices? Am I making these choices out of habit, automatic mm -hmm. thinking, automatic conditioning, or am I pausing as we started this meeting tonight, listening to heart, centering in heart, and then with that awareness, choosing whether we are going to rework the puzzle or be working on a different puzzle. <laughs> so, uh, so this is uh, one aspect of free will, is process and choice towards awareness, which then enables a deeper exercise of free will. And also, awareness enables us to become aware of our conditioning. That, too, is an act of free will. It is remarkable that we have the consciousness, the capacity, it's called in psychology, meta-awareness, the awareness of our awareness. We can be aware of that which has shaped and conditioned us and which is pushing us in certain directions of choices. But we can be aware of it. And we can choose with awareness of that, but not necessarily in that direction. So, all right, this is a good start. Let's hear some other comments, individual group comments. Anything else that came up? Um, so good to see you back. <laughs> I, in our group, we had a question about if you know, you're, you don't have access to that which is higher, or religion, or God, or let's say you're living in the jungle, or something like this, mm. how would one know how to get there? And I thought that it was actually simple. I think that even though we um, may not have all these resources available to us if we live in the jungle, that as a human being, you're born with an intuition mm -hmm. of knowing something that feels good and if it feels good yes. it is good and you do it right so mm -hmm. like if something is if i feel like it's bad i won't do it if i feel like it's good i will do it and then later you know in western society we develop laws around i felt it was good let's make a law to solidify that it is and you mm -hmm. know make sure we all construct exactly as so um so I think it's simple. I think that our heart and our intuition tell us what is good and what is bad, and we follow what is good, and that brings us to a higher level of accessing God in the best way that we can. Mm -hmm. um, what I think can get hard is that sometimes, um, also s systemically at the institutional level, when we institutionalize that which maybe is bad, though, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, <laughs> So if it's, you know, too individualistic and we're, um, we develop in relation to the mainstream, right? So mm -hmm. if my environment is saying uh, it is good to um, be X in society and I get a positive reinforcement when I am doing X or when I represent mm -hmm. myself as X, then I will continue to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And I get this sort of artificial feeling of that it's good, but I might get an empty void of feeling that it's, it's bad from my soul or my heart or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that that's really important, that at the institutional level, that we institutionalize 
things like community and that we um, develop positive reinforcements toward the community. And I think our other group members can talk much more about that. <laughs> So before we move on, thank you very much, Dominique, and I'd like to really follow up on what you were saying. There is a universal recognition of the fact that young children have spiritual intuitions. There is no question about the fact that young children have a way of knowing which is apparently not learned. So, uh, so this is important to recognize. It's also important that developmental psychology sees that disappearing and receding more and more as the voice of so-called reason grows in school age and before that. So the peak of children's intuition, spiritual intuitions, actually is age three, four. By five, you start to hear the voice of reason emerging and the left brain really developing very rapidly and uh, and so those spiritual intuitions are then suppressed and they have to learn the voice of reason and as you said the voice of reason oftentimes institutionally can rationalize things that actually don't feel right mm -hmm. and we have many examples of that and so there is definitely this this tension between these early intuitions and the voice of reason. And what you see is that the more we feel these tensions, the more we are propelled to move beyond the institutional, where we actually construct reason not as narrowly rationalistic rationalizations, <laughs> but, uh, but the voice of reason as, as a philosophical inquiry and mm -hmm. connecting it once again to a heart-mind epistemology, which we talked about here a lot, but now cultivating it intentionally, <laughs> recognizing that a frame of reference, reason is a very important, enlightened reason is a very important frame of reference and faculty that has to be developed, and that we also have another faculty which we associate with the heart that is present in every child from the beginning. And when the voice of reason and the voice of heart begin to be intentionally coordinated um, and, and enter into coherence, that's when we have the most powerful ways of knowing heart, mind, epistemologies and ways of knowing with coherence which propel us beyond any narrow, both beyond the purely intuitive and beyond the purely rationalistic into that integration which is uh, moving forward towards um, with the forces of attraction. So uh, just just as a, as a follow-up here, thank you. All right, we had some more contributions. Let's hear some other voices. One thing that, that came up in our group um, was just the, the significance of orienting ourselves to the force of attraction mm. as, we, as we progress through these stages, especially as we try, attempt to progress beyond the institutional stage. And, um, and very helpfully, remi the reminder that this force of attraction is in its essence love. Mm. Um, and, you know, this kind of you know, unity consciousness in the spiritual realm, but that, that love is somehow intimately intertwined and, and, and embodied in that, in that essence. Um, and that is as kind of a guiding force as we orient ourselves on this forward motion. All right. So when we're talking about the second question, which is what are we doing individually and collectively? What more can we be doing? in order to help propel our environments and our communities and our societies beyond this being the ultimate vision of life, which is really a self-defeating vision of life and human consciousness and intelligence, then one way to think about it is speaking the language, I'll say, of attraction to cultivate the forces of attraction. So we all notice that when we read spiritual sources, these spiritual sources, when they are experienced as spiritual, actually work on the principle of encouragement. You mm -hmm. always feel uplifted. That's how you know you've read a spiritual source, because it uplifts you. You feel encouraged. You feel attracted upward. You're not chastised. You're attracted upward. That's, that's very interesting. But of course, in this attraction, there's also the dialectic of reason. 
So as the valley of reason is negotiated, we can move more and more towards the, the, the realm of attraction. But until that is the case, the valley of reason is important as well. We also have to understand why certain things work better, why certain things are more desirable, why they're ultimately more attractive. There has to be also understanding. So it's the force of attraction and the language of understanding. It's what we can think of. How am I bringing these forces of upward attraction and a language of understanding in my environments every day? Am I doing that? Am I being explicit? Or am I hoping that somebody else is going to do it? That um, there will be laws instituted. We live in a time of change from ground up. And so we are the forces of attraction. We are the forces of reason. We are the forces that create horizons. Um, Jessica. Your second question, uh, Dr. Lina, about what can we do. I think one of the things that I uh, try to do um, is to listen to my intuition. Mm. And I spent a really long time kind of unearthing that voice mm. and then figuring out what it sounds like and how can I... How can I identify it and understand it versus the voice of my ego? Mm -hmm. um, and like we have, a, a, my intuition and I have a pretty solid communication. I don't always listen, <laughs> but, I, but I often hear it and I often know what the, the direction that it's pointing me towards. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, what am I going to do on a Saturday night? I check my intuition. Like. What am I going to have for lunch? Okay. I check my intuition. Like, it literally <laughs> Wonderful. runs my life in as much as I listen to it. Um, and that, I think, moves me into a different place than if I listen to other parts of myself. Mm. And I think that collectively moves us to a different place mm. than if we listen to other parts of ourselves. So mm. even if somebody asks me, if I want, if I would be willing to do a particular act of service, mm -hmm. I check with my intuition mm. um, first, and I don't always like the answer, <laughs> <laughs> but I but I trust its wisdom. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Well, friends, this has been uh, another very comprehensive journey, and so I want to ask you now to use your free will to take charge of the process forward. We've covered a lot of ground. So I'd like to invite each one of you to review uh, the videos that are already online. This one hopefully will go online very soon as well. In the next few days, we're hoping. And then review everything and reflect on what is emerging as a course forward. There are some central concepts that we have covered here some very key central concepts, mind, free will, development, languages as holding environments, uh, the nature of health, um, dynamics and di dialectics of development. So all of these things are tools. That's their only value as, as tools, tools that enable and empower us to take greater ownership in the environments that we are creating or to consult collectively on how we can take greater ownership. Mm -hmm. So please reflect and bring your ideas on the 22nd and I look forward to seeing you again.